Matt Hobbs. And Matt, I'll bet you're a little bit warmer than we are. We're expecting snow up here <laughs> in Winston-Salem. Thanks a lot for joining us. Really appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks for having me, Larry. Yeah, a little bit, a uh, little bit warmer. Not too much warmer, but a little bit warmer down here. We don't have any white stuff on the ground, so that's that's a positive at this time of the year. Which is a good thing because you guys get cranked up Monday, huh? Yeah, individuals start up Monday. The kids get back on campus. We start classes Monday, and then uh, we'll start individuals and kind of just roll. And you know, I don't think anybody knows exactly what would ha what's going to happen with the beginning of the season or what the season looks like or how it's going to end. But I think that everybody's excited to get back to work. I know that. I know that our guys are excited and, you know, obviously the coaching staff's ready to get back to work too. Well, everybody felt the same way at the start of last year, you know, what's going to happen this year. And you guys were off to a good start, 11 and five things were rolling along pretty well. Yeah, we, uh, we had, we had started off, I think seven and seven or eight. No, and we're playing really well. We went down to Houston and kind of stubbed our toe a little for about four or five games and did not play well, but then came back and beat a really good Grand Canyon team twice. And they uh, finished off the series the previous weekend against South Alabama, went in two of those games. So we were on like a four game winning streak when we, when everything kind of just got shut down. Um, but you know, the young, we got some younger guys on the mound that got, got four or five, six innings a piece. And, you know, a couple guys got starts that, um, you know, we, we had wanted to be able to get the chance to see at some point. Uh, during the season so we were lucky enough to get those in in the first 16 games and I think now it's just um, you know that that time period where they were all on their own and away from us there's you know there's two groups of people that come out of that thing it's the guys that took advantage of that time and the guys that use that time as an excuse for why they couldn't do things and every one of those kids and every one of our kids and everybody else's kids had way different scenarios in terms of what they had access to what they were had availability to and creativity was at a high level during that time. And I think that, you know, we saw some guys make huge gains and it was like this, this fall when we, when we got back on the field with them, I was blown away by what I saw on the pitching side, just at how well guys had trained themselves. And, you know, we obviously tried to help them along the way within the, within the rules is what we, what we could do with them when they were away from us. But, those kids had to be incredibly creative and those guys had to work incredibly hard on their own and be diligent about it with, with no real beginning in sight when we were doing, going through this, we didn't know when our guys were going to be able to come back to campus. We didn't know what fall ball was going to look like. And it just, it was, it was incredibly gratifying to watch the guys go out there and play and have trained so hard. So I think that, you know, that's, that only, got me more fired up about what's going to happen when we start individuals on Monday. Well, and guys trying to find a place to uh, a place to play if they possibly could. Any idea what kind of percentage of your guys were able to find a way to uh, to play some games last summer? So I'd say we probably had, you know, 30, 30, 30, 40% of our guys were able to find leagues. You know, the Northwoods had guys, uh, a couple teams that played, uh, Santa Barbara had a had a team that was playing. Um, there was two leagues in Florida that had you know opportunities to play. We had a league here called you know one of a, a local league here with college kids. That, so we had some of our guys playing in that. Um, and it, it it was it was hit or miss though about yeah. who could actually be able to find games, who could actually be able to find consistent. You know. The, the thing about a lot of those leagues is they all did everything they could to play and, you know, commend them on that, but there was going to be disruption throughout the summer. So, you know, some of our guys would go and play in these leagues and they played, you know, 15 games, which is better than nothing. And, and we're the rule certainly not going to things went along too. So it was tough. I'd like to it remind was, you yeah. that are joining us today. Um, we are going to be giving away a pitch logic pro bundle uh, for people that are joining in during the course of this interview. If you've got a question for Matt Hobbs, Go ahead and type it into the uh, chat room and we'll get that question out to him. We're good, and if you send your email address along in the chat function, or if you're someplace else in the convention and put that in our, uh, in our chat room, we are going to have a drawing for a PitchLogic bundle, which is the PitchLogic ball, the pro app for three months, and uh, also a t-shirt. So we'll, we'll contact you with the information for whoever wins uh, for all the folks that stop in and visit us today. And, uh, Matt, you've had a chance to look at that pro app a little bit, and uh, you have been using uh, the Pitch Logic Ball for a number of years. When you were here in Winston Salem, you came to visit the lab and uh, actually had some great suggestions for us. 
What are you thinking about the uh, the new pro app that we've got out? It's really a, kind of an all encompassing tool now, and it was always a really good piece, and it always gave us you know really good information about. You know, different things that we were able to track on the ball um, and with our guys and with our throwers but now it, it it really brings it kind of it brings it all together with the different functions and you know going through it with with you guys you know a couple of weeks back it, it, it kind of blows your mind about what it is actually capable of tracking so <laughs> it's it's great you know we've had some guys throw with it and you know guys really like it and the feel of the ball has been great and the the data they get back is really it's quality it's just quality information and i think that that's one of the biggest things is everybody's got access to tools these days and the the most important thing is consistent quality and that's what the the, the ball uh, pitch electric ball really provides is consistent quality well, the consistency is one of the things, you know, baseball being the game that you repeat so much over and over and over. Consistency is always what we strive for. And uh, the, the amount of pitches that pitch logic picks up, you know, uh, David Rankin says all the time, if you're not capturing 95% of your pitches, you're probably not setting properly or something else. And so we like to, we appreciate the fact that, uh, that, that it comes back so consistently. You know, we've talked about the different things that make it so valuable. And one of the things that I really have enjoyed about some of the new uh, uh, functions that are in it is with the pitch logic ball, you're catching the ball at the speed out of your finger, out of your hand, the last touch function. And then you're also getting the different speed at home play mm -hmm. you know, so that you can make your adjustments along the way. And you're getting the instant feedback, which I think is a huge function as well. Yeah, I think it's instantaneous feedback is one of the great things about about the product. And one of the things that is is most impactful to pitchers, because it's one thing to be able to get, you know, a you know, 20 second feed from some of the other products that are out there on the market. But, you know, just instantaneous ball leaves your hand and then all of a sudden you, here it is on your phone, or your iPad or whatever you're using it on, um, able to come back and then. Also, the ability for those guys to be able to train with them remotely has been really good. So they were able to basically take some of the things that we use here with them to wherever they, you know, they live and they, when they're away from us for the summer or they're away from us for the winter or whatever, um, whatever it is, but you're able to get that kind of information and they're able to, and they're able to train with it on their own too. It's a, it's a, it allows them to be able to do a lot of things remotely and a lot of things by themselves, which is, you know, as you know, as a pitcher, it's not, you're not always going to have your pitching coach telling you exactly what to do on every pitch, nor would you want to you would want to have the freedom of, you know, yourself to go out and try things out on your own and be able to try to sift your way through problems. And this ball can kind of lead you in different ways and help you along the way of saying, all right, am I consistently reaching these markers? Am I consistently hitting these types of breaks? Am I consistently getting this type of spin axis? Whatever, whatever it is. Am I, am I consistently getting these things? Yeah. Um, and I think that's a big, a big component. Man, I know that there were a lot of days that I wish I'd had pitching coach standing behind me when I was on the mound reminding right. me of those cues. Because sometimes the game gets pretty fast for you. You know, when you've got a couple of guys on and you've got 35,000 people in the stands, things tend to speed up. Things tend to speed up. No doubt. You told a great story when we talked a, a week or so ago about one of your players walking in and saying, have you heard anything about this call? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we were uh, we were throwing uh, some bullpens in our facility, and we had a pro a pro guy who's with uh, the Colorado Rockies, I believe. And he walks in, and he's like, "We're flipping this ball up in his glove," and he's like, "Hey, have you seen this? Have you heard of this pitch logic ball?" <laughs> Just laughing to myself, I was like, "Yeah, yeah, I've heard of it." <laughs> so you know, pro organizations are obviously taking notice and sending them out to their guys to train with. So I think it's it, it goes to show you that. I think that people value, again, I think what it comes down to is people value consistent, good quality information. Yeah. And things that you can really be able to track over time. It, you're considered one of the gurus at, in, in the college. No, hardly, hardly. You're considered one of the gurus in the college game as far as using data and, and as far as uh, the analytics and everything else. Maybe you could get some, give some of the coaches that are watching some of the ideas and guys that don't have access to all the different technology, some of the basics of what are important and some of the things you started out learning and found to be still a basis of what you use today at the level that you are now. I think that tried and true things are the, you're looking at breaks and how the ball moves. Those are tried and true things. And if you're, 
if you're really just starting with a baseline level of learning, it's just how does the ball consistently move? You know, what type of spin are you creating? Are you able to create, you know, consistent backspin? Are you cutting the ball? Are you creating side spin on changeups? What you know, whatever it is, it's just the, what are you doing consistently? Are, those are the things that are the easiest to track. You can get that with like an iPhone camera. You can get some things with, with spin where you're not like if you don't have access to any of this stuff. Everybody's got a cell phone camera these days and you know the, the the quality on those cameras are so good now it's like those that was the stuff we were paying you know thousands of dollars for and you know when i started out doing this stuff in 2003 or 2004 we were paying tons of money for the camera that you now get as a part of your phone and i think that being able to evaluate the type of spin is going to take you a lot of different ways you know we, we try to look at pitchers in are, are they going to pitch north and south or are they going to pitch east and west mm -hmm. and that's you know, that goes into how the ball moves, that goes into their delivery, it goes into a lot of different things. So if you can figure out horizontal and vertical breaks on, on pitches and how they move side to side or north and south, I think that you can go a long way in terms of figuring out, all right, what type of spin do then we want to do we want to then create? How do we want the spin to move? How do we want the ball to exit the pitcher's hand? And that's why I think that, that last touch feature is obviously really great for the on the on the pitch logic ball. But if you don't have those things, you can still get a, get a lot of that stuff just from, you know, doing something just as simple as drawing a line on a ball and just, you know, is it wobbly spin? Is it straight spin? I mean, what, what kind of type of spin are you getting? You can start as basic as you want. And, but really, if you do have some access to something that's going to be able to spit out some information and give you something back, I think that starting with people go to spin rate a lot because it's what gets talked about on television. There's a lot of things that can influence spin rate, but how the ball is going to move from your hand to home plate is the most important thing. And then, you know, you can take into some, you know, some really basic data analytics of just evaluating what type of performance the thing has against hitters. I mean, I, it, it's never going to be more important than that. I mean, all these accessory metrics we look at, the only thing that's important is how the ball performs against the bat and letting your hitter, your, your pitchers know, you know, what pitches are effective and what parts of the zone against what types of hitters is one of the most important, if that's the most important thing, it's not one of the most important things in how the ball is going to perform and how, if you're going to throw, if you're going to try to force your, if you're a side to side delivery, if you have an east west delivery and you're going to try to force the ball north and south, is that going to be the biggest thing that's going to be able to influence, you know, good results against your hitters, you're going to want your delivery to match your stuff and your movement or, and vice versa. And then how, I think that is going to show, will show, help to show pitchers that, you know, this is also going to have a better effect against the bat. You talked about spin rates. How does spin efficiency play into what you look at? So if you're talking about spin efficiency on, you know, a forcing fastball and you're talking about a 90% efficient fastball versus a 95 to 100% efficient fastball. If we're looking at vertical break, if you have like, if you're talking about 16 inches of vertical break on a 90% efficient fastball, if you can backspin the baseball, you can pick up vertical movement. Um, and I think that's one of the ways that when you're looking at spin efficiency, if you're going to want to evaluate what type of pitch that you have, what type of pitch you're throwing, you're going to want obviously less efficiency on a slider because you're trying to pick up more bullet spin. You're going to want more efficiency on a curveball because you're trying to pick up top spin. You're going to want to look at if you're going to throw two seam fastballs, for example, you know, I think people look at fastballs and think like, okay, 99% to hundred percent efficiency is great on these pitches, but sometimes you can deflect spin on a fastball and have it be inefficient and still get sync depending on how the ball's spinning out of your hand, depending upon, you know, how much of the skin of the ball is exposed to the air and how much, you know, top spin, basically how much side, how much side spin you can put on a two seam fastball and expose as much leather as you can to push the ball down. Sometimes those pitches aren't going to have as efficient spin. Sometimes those pitches will be inefficient spin and people will assume they're going to cut because it's like 90% to 80, 85% efficient pitch. And most people go with cut, that ball's going to cut. Those pitches don't always do that. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important to look at efficiency, not in the vacuum of this number means this and this number means this. You can have numbers that influence things, certainly. Like you want a pitch to be able to spin efficiency if you're trying to efficiently, if you're trying to throw, you know, 1230 till backspun fastballs at the top of the strike zone and pick up 20 inches of carry. Like you're going to want that pitch to spin efficiently. But if I'm going to throw a sinker, I might not want as much efficiency. I need to I need to kill something to make the ball do something, right? Like that's what it needs to do. If I'm gonna if I'm gonna throw something that's gonna sink or move, like changeups, for example, I need to kill lift. I need to kill as much vertical lift as I can, or I need to kill efficiency, or I need to kill velocity, or I need to kill spin. 
Like you need to do something to make the ball do something different than a different than another pitch. So I think looking at spin efficiency and in a vacuum of 100 percent is good and 60 percent is bad is not always the way you can look at things like they're different things mean they all mean everything means something different when you're looking at how the ball is going to move and how efficiency is going to influence those things. But you and I first met about 2014, and I say this all the time. You're the guy that really started me down this path. So I use your name a lot of different ways, <laughs> a lot of different places. But, uh, but I started paying attention to exactly what the ball did in a different manner. People might not notice this, but I am considerably older than you. And pitched back in the 70s and 80s and threw a hard, heavy sinker. And I would love to see what my good sinker when I was throwing good did, you know, numbers wise coming out now. It just, that sticks in the back of my head almost every single day with what I know now. Right, I think that a lot of people that have been playing the game and either played the game at a high level or have coached for a long time are like walking pitch logic balls or walking rap sodos or walking whatever. They're just, they've, they've done these things so many times. They've seen so many of these things that they could tell you exactly what the ball is gonna do out of their hand. And they can be right when they're trying to infer spin or efficiency or whatever. Um, but they might not be 100% right. There might be something that's not, they're not, there may be something they're not catching. And I think that when you're, when you're starting to really look into accessory metrics on pitches, there's a lot to that. It's not just one thing with every pitcher. There's going to be two or three things with every pitcher, but there might be 80 points of data that you're getting back from some of these, some, from some products or 20 points of data. And you can't apply everything to everybody. And I think that's the danger you get into sometimes when you're using tech or whatever to try to evaluate pitchers is putting them in these like specific buckets of this guy does this. So this number, so this number is important. The bottom line that you have to always look at when you're using any, when you're using any, either any piece of equipment or technology or any type of philosophy of mechanics or delivery or throwing programs is every pitcher is a little bit different. So they all need a little bit different. They all need something different to be able to be effective and to be able to reach whatever the ceiling of that pitcher is. So the important things are to be able to sift through all of the information that you get back from like, for example, for the pitch logic ball, you get a ton of information back on every pitch that you throw. You get great information. You get video feedback with, I think what the pro app is the video feedback and it can sync up to the data. And it's like, mm -hmm. man, this is crazy. This is awesome. Um, but not every piece of information you get back is going to impact you the same. Like you could be doing, like, for example, you could be doing something that shows you that your fastball is 80% efficient. And you're like, well, no, I need my fastball to be hundred percent efficient. But if you make it more efficient, you straighten it out. It's not as good. Like it might be actually telling you that you're doing something great with this pitch and producing the types of vertical movement, horizontal movement that you want. And it's because it's not as efficient. It's because the efficiency is a little bit lower and that just happens to match the plane of your slot. And you are able to push the ball, to push the ball vertically into sync, or you'll be able to backspin the baseball into carry. Like you might be doing some things that aren't, that aren't what people would think of as normal that are actually turning you into an outlier. So I think that the, the ball can help show you some of those things. Yeah, and getting back to my career just a little bit, the harder I tried to throw, the straighter it got and the harder it was flying out. And that wasn't doing me yeah. any good. You know, when I took a little bit off and threw my natural delivery, natural sinker and was getting ground balls, uh, then the game was a lot of fun. Um, you know, there's, <laughs> there are so many different ways. You mentioned the motion capture, which I think is, is a fantastic feature. Number one, because it's self-editing. So as soon as you start your delivery, you're getting the 3D tunnel effect where you can see exactly what the ball is doing and it's on there in 3D every 10 milliseconds all the way to home plate. And so you can, you can actually see what the ball is doing. It's seam orientation is absolutely accurate. So you know how the ball is in your hand as you're going back, which you know just that slight turn in your hand makes such a huge difference. And, and the pitch logic ball does give you all that. Um, what other kinds of things are, are important to you as far as once you start getting guys to the next level? I think that there's a, a bunch of, I mean, you can look at the, the big things that are always going to be important is, you know, how they're going to handle all the other parts that don't involve, you know, like baseball metrics. Like how do they handle running game? How do they handle big crowds? How do they handle when they start failing? How do they handle all these things? And I think that those are, 
those are going to be consistent across the board with no matter who you're coaching, no matter what level, those things are always going to, as you move up the ladder, they're all, those things are always going to pick up and always going to get more and more um, difficult to deal with. And the guys that can handle them are always going to be the, you know, the guys that you're going to count on in big spots. And, you know, I think those things are kind of go without saying, but we, we really, as we're evaluating and as we're kind of growing our guys up is to be able to try to see, you know, when we're, trying to move them on from here, which is our job, part of our job in addition to trying to, you know, win the World Series and win a bunch of games at Arkansas is to try to get them ready for professional baseball. It's to try to get these guys polished up and get them ready to go play pro ball. And the things that we have to be able to do as, as coaches at this level is make sure that we're preparing them for what they're going to see when they get there and what they're going to, how they're going to be talked to, I think is really important because as the game continues to evolve and as professional baseball continues to just get a ton of really good coaches and coordinators. We have to make sure that our guys have knowledge of all of these things that we've been talking about, because it's, it, the game is not heading there. The game is there yeah. and they're going to have to know their pitch profile and they're going to have to know what type of pitcher they are. They're going to have to know what their ball does because they're going to always have to go have something to fall back on. Um, right before break, we were, we were throwing uh, kind of like exit bullpens with a few of our guys and we had a pitcher that, in the fall, it had some really good success with a slider and then it kind of, you know, taken was just kind of starting their ramp up and they were throwing a couple of bullpens before they went home. And in the last week, we would legally work with guys through the NCAA and he was throwing some sliders and it was getting this lift on the pitch. It was like a two. So he was getting two inches of vertical lift on a slider all of a sudden. And he's sitting there like, man, the ball just feels like it's kind of squirting out of my hand. And we were able to go back to what he knew about his sliders. Like, well, my slider, usually he just looks at his dashboard and he's looking at numbers and he's, oh, my slider usually has, um, you know, negative one to negative two inches of vertical break. And these, this slider that I'm throwing has three inches of lift. So when he's thinking about the ball sliding out of his hand, it's really just his angle of his wrist is to probably turn cockeyed and the ball's shooting up the nose of the ball's turned up as in, as he's trying to bring the ball down and through the strike zone. And he's able to look at that number and say, all right, I know what this number was doing when, it, when I was pitching really well. I know that how, how the movement of the ball is affected by these numbers. And I know, and I associate that with the, what that felt like to me. Yeah. So now I can say this ball is spitting out of my hand. My wrist is probably turned a little sideways. The ball's up and out of my hand. We're able to go back, look at some, some high speed video and show him here's the slider you were throwing in September. Here's the slider you just tried to throw at the end of November. And these are the differences. And these are the subtle differences in these pitches. And he's able to take those, that knowledge, that information, that feel associated with the visual that he's able to see and the numbers he's able to look at and be able to then take the next two sliders and drive them two to three inches of vertical movement all of a sudden and the pitch is moving correctly. And he's like, okay, I remember what that felt like. And I just associated numbers, video some conversation and feel with a the ability to create a result and they're going to have to be able to do that when they leave when they leave us so our job is to be able to prepare them to know their numbers and understand what those numbers mean and then understand how those numbers influence movement and then how that is the numbers that influence movement influence hitters yep. and i think all of those things together are are a big part of what we would look for from guys as we do move them on from us. Because if I have a bunch of guys that understand all of those things and can make pretty quick adjustments on the fly in game based on feel, and then can go back in and look at, all right, what were, when, when they're doing some post-processing on their outings, what were my numbers, you know, not my, not my stat line, but like what, how, what kind of vertical break did I get on my fastball today? What kind of horizontal break was I getting on my slider? What kind of vertical did I get on my, you know, my, how much depth did I have on my change up? where part of the zone was I able to access with my curveball, and then they can go into the bullpen three days later and be able to take that and turn it into actionable movement towards a different goal or to sharpen their pitches to get them ready for their next outing. Mm -hmm. Now we've taken technology and been able to breathe it into the game instead of just knowing, all right, I throw 96 or I, you know, I have a 2400 RPM spin rate fastball, which is it, you know, that could be a good thing, but if it's cutting, it's probably not a good thing. Yeah. So it's, it's one of those things where they don't just have to understand what vertical movement, like something like that means. They need to know how that influences them and how that influences movement and how that influences result of the pitch and how that influences the type, the part of the zone they're able to access frequently. Like what are the other things that this number influences? So as we start to grow our pitchers and develop them 
Um, it's not just get them stronger, have them start throwing harder, teach them another pitch. It's they need to be knowledgeable and they don't need to like look at it like you or I look at these things. They need to look at it and make it make sense to them. It's not my job as a pitching coach is not to explain to them everything I know about pitching. It's to explain to them the things that can help them and make sure that they not only understand it, but they can use it on their own. Cause that's what they're going to have to be able to do is be good when we're not around them. They're going to have to know, they're going to have to be able to go break down a post game report and say, all right, I know these things about these numbers and this is what was happening in that game. That was either good or bad. I need to go talk to, you know, coach Hobbs or whoever their coach is and be able to say, I feel like these are the things that I need to work on, on in my Tuesday or my Wednesday pen based on this information and these results and you know the idea of what we're about to face the the next weekend and be able to do that because that's those are the things that are going to make them that are going to set them apart and you know that the talent's not enough anymore well you're not shy about making trips out to the mound i, I remember that <laughs> vividly from the tv games that i broadcast when you were uh, the pitching coach but you can't be there uh, every single pitch. We're talking with Matt Hobbs, University of Arkansas pitching coach and a good friend, and appreciate you joining us here today. If, if you've joined us in this chat room, if you send us your email address, we will enter you into a contest to win a uh, PitchLogic Pro bundle, which is going to be a PitchLogic baseball, along with a t-shirt and three months of the PitchLogic Pro app. And uh, we're going to be giving uh, one of those away at the end of the day. Also, if you pass on to your friends that if, if they drop into our site, we'll be giving one away to whoever visits us during the course of the day. Uh, also like to remind everybody that tomorrow, Clay Holmes from the Pittsburgh Pirates is going to be joining me at uh, 1230. Scott Mitchell, the former minor league coordinator of the Pirates, will be with me about two o'clock. Uh, John Hendricks from the Wake Forest University is scheduled to join me as well on Saturday. And uh, we'll probably have a, a mystery guest on Saturday as well. So I remember, and, I, and you've heard me tell this story before, Matt, I think too. When we, the very first day we went over there, David Rankin said to you, and this goes back to what you were just saying, uh, what are the five biggest problems you have? And you looked at him and said, I've got 16 sets of five biggest problems. So your point about every guy needing a different cue and needing different information for the way he throws. I don't think you can overemphasize enough. And one of the things that troubles me as I see the direction that baseball is going now is it seems like a lot of people want to get caught in the either or camp. You either have to be, I'm going to teach by the book and by the numbers, or I'm going to be by the, I'm going to be a touch and feel and that kind of thing. And, and the good ones, the really good ones, the gurus in the industry like yourself, are the guys that combine those two? I think that you, I mean, it's all information, right? All of it. Like the data is information, the touch and feel component, the delivery component, it's just information. And you got to use it all. You got to use every piece of it. You got to be able to talk to the scout that's been out, you know, baseball for 60 years and he's seen more baseball in his life than I'll ever see in mine. And him say like, well, you just got to tell that guy to put his glove in the box. <laughs> and it's like, what is this guy talking about? And <laughs> he's right. He's not wrong because it influences the movement that I'm trying to like create on these with this, all these numbers, but he's right. And he's like, he's telling you something that's so simple. And if you don't, it's if you don't take just one second, because when you were talking about three inches of vertical lift coming out of the hand a minute ago, I said to myself, he went fly fishing. Right. Cause that's what we called it. Right. It's just like, it's something that's just like, the, all of the information is incredibly valuable. And the, the old school coach that has never lifted their finger to try to learn two things about technology has never been more valuable because they understand so many things about the game that, you know, if you're all on the tech side and you're not teaching somebody how to be a one, two, you know, one, two, five to the plate with runners in scoring position, then you're not, you're not a very good pitching coach. So like, that's never been more value in how to in playing the game well because that's what's not that's what doesn't happen these days to be 100 percent honest is the game's not really played all that well the game's played really exciting like there's really exciting things that happen but a lot of the things that that we see is they just you end up with some guys that just aren't good baseball players until they learn until they learn those things through failure until they learn those things through like a fall practice season where they realize like my, my 95 is no longer good enough 
Like I need to figure out, we had, we had a kid come in this fall. It's 92 to 95 with a really good breaking ball and a good change up. And it's just like, man, I'm just going to blow through these Arkansas hitters. And by the third time they saw him, it was like three homers, two walks, seven runs. And he comes back into the dugout. Like he didn't know what hit him. And he's like, I, I can't just keep pitching like this. <laughs> and it's like, no kidding. <laughs> you got to learn how to be able to sequence that 95 to 90, you know, 93, 95, 92, 95 mile an hour fastball with your other stuff. It's okay to go out and throw 50% off speed pitches. Sometimes you don't have to, you know, establish your fastball to be a big tough guy. And those are the things that guys have to learn. And it's not any knock on any level of baseball. It's not like the kids aren't tough enough or anything like that. They just don't know. And that's part of what, what happens with, you know, you're either going to be an old school coach or a new school coach. It's, it's, it's insanity to me that, that there's a difference between the two. Why? Like, why wouldn't we all just try to figure it all out? And why wouldn't we all just try to, at the end of the day, we just want complete pitchers. Like we want complete pitchers and complete players. And you can't have them by doing all of one or all of the other. Like you got to be able to, to at least want to learn everything. And I think that that's, that's probably the thing that's the most kind of glossed over these days where you just, you know, you're going to email the coach and send him, here's my Rapsodo or my track man or my, you know, my pitch logic information instead of like, here's how I would use this information. Here's how I evaluate myself based on this information. Here's how I train with this product. Which is and a great question for a coach to ask the kid that's no doubt. the information too, because yeah, that's an outstanding snapshot. Mm -hmm. What happens when it doesn't look like that in the fourth inning? Well, what happens when you're not a one seven to the plate and you're not in the bullpen anymore? Yeah. Like those, are the, those are the things that like Matt, that Matt end up mattering. Like what do the metrics look like when you're not in the stretch, when you're in the stretch? Um, and that's what I think that, that using these tools, because that's what they are. They're just tools to train properly is how you maximize them. Yeah. Like put yourself, if you're in a bullpen and you're throwing with the pitch logic ball and you're getting this great feedback, all right, now I'm going to try to be a one, one to the plate on every one of these pitches and get, now I want to see what my metrics look like. Do they change? How are they different? I'm going to try to put myself in all these situations. I'm going to try to be, you know, as fast as I can be to the plate under control, or I'm going to try to make sure that I'm going to, I'm going to throw this. This is what a two strike breaking ball should look like for me. If I'm going to try to be able to go hunt a punch out right now. And I'm going to be able to be a little bit slower to the plate because I've got two strikes on the hitter and I don't care about that runner at second base anymore. And I'm going to try to drive this breaking ball into the ground and I trust my catcher that's going to block it, but I want to see what these metrics look like so that I can go back to these things uh, when I have to, when I have to be able to recreate these pitches, I, I can know how much of them, if, if, if it is going to be, maybe it's more horizontal movement that you're picking up and you don't even know it. Like maybe you're missing, maybe you don't know, maybe you don't, and maybe this ball can help and maybe the information can help. And I think that, Training properly with the tools is is probably the thing that that I I think that's the most important to be able to coach your players as they get to your campus or your, or they come into your facility or they come into your high school or they come into their pitching lesson or whatever is they've got to be able to understand that these are the things that we can do with these with this product and here's how I can train better because of this product. Well, I, you know, I get the opportunity, obviously, to see a lot of coaches at a lot of different levels. And I spend the majority of my time working with the pro guys. But I talked to a high school a couple of weeks ago, and, and we ran through all the different things that Pitch Logic can do and, you know, at all different kinds of levels to reach guys. And I said, but remember this, there's going to come a point in time where you have to back up third base. Because no matter how you throw it, somebody's going to whack it. Yep. <laughs> And if you got somebody on, you got to be in the right place in case something else happens. So you got to do, you got to play the whole game. You can't just say I threw a 95 mile an hour fastball and that's all I've got to learn. It just, it just doesn't work. You get the unique opportunity to see more 95 more <laughs> mile per hour fastballs than a lot of guys do. And one of the things that's really intriguing to me about the way you style yourself and, and I watched you do this is the way you compose a staff using different weapons as you're recruiting. I think that's fascinating. Yeah, I think that that's the, that's the main thing that we look for when we go out and recruit pitching, at least, you know, that I have in my career is try to, you know, the, it's not hard to find out who the best pitcher on, you know, the, the team that you're watching is usually. It's not hard to go figure out who can pitch at Arkansas or who can pitch at Wake Forest or who can pitch at Missouri or any of these places that I've been. You go to the game, and you're like, that guy's probably the one of the better pitchers. He could probably help us. But 
do we already have three of him? Like, do we already have three of him? And, you know, this lefty over here, this, you know, this low slot righty over here, we don't have any of him. <laughs> Shouldn't we be able to, you know, go get that guy instead of spending, you know, maybe our, our scholarship money and our time on this other guy, we can go get this guy who actually fits a need that we have. And, or, or when we get a guy on campus, all right, well, this, you know, the slot he throws from just does not work anymore. We got to be able to drop this guy down or teach him a new pitch or something because you want, what you need is to, to win at any of these levels, you need to be able to be very, very variable in your bullpen. You can't look the same. You just can't. Yeah. And, you know, I've, I've coached on pitching staffs that had, you know, half 50% right, 50% left and a bunch of different looks and they've been very successful. And then I had a pitching staff that had one left-handed pitcher. I think the first year I was at Wake, we had like one left-handed pitcher on the entire staff. And it was like, you was about to put a guy on the staff too. If yeah, I'm what do, what do we do if there's a, like, if we have to go, if we have to match up, what do we do? I mean, we were using right-handed guys with changeup as our left-handed matchup guys. <laughs> so we ended up having to do, and it, if you don't have variable looks and you don't have a bunch of guys that can do different things and pitch in different roles too, is I think a really important thing, not just have like this guy only throws the seventh inning or this guy only throws the last two innings or this guy only, you know, comes in in the third and goes long. Like you got to be able to do everything. And, you know, that's one thing that I, I do feel like the places that I've been, have done a good job, you know, with the head coaches support all of the time is like in the fall, everybody does everything. Like everybody relieves, everybody starts, everyone does everything. And I got the idea, you know, I think my, yeah, it was like my second year of coaching. I was watching our head coach at Santa Barbara City College work with infielders. And he had the infielders, like everyone took ground balls at third, everyone took ground balls at second, everybody was taking ground balls at short. And it was because we just didn't know what we had, right? We had no idea as a junior college, we had like 70 guys out there in the first day of practice, we had a all these guys going to all these positions trying to figure out what they did and i and we've got guys like on the pitching side like okay these are the three starters these are the relievers and it's, it was so just here's who's who the guys are and i was like well let's just have everybody do everything let's have them all start let's have them all close let's have them all do everything in the fall and just figure out what we've got so that if they have to do different roles in the in the spring they've at least done it once and that that's been one of the like most impactful things i think for most of the pitchers is you know, your closer sometimes is going to have to throw four innings and he's going to have to know how to have done that. He's going to have to be trained to do that. And your closer sometimes only going to throw one and your starter sometimes is going to have to, you know, in a, in a NCAA regional, if we haven't used him yet, is going to have to come in out of bullpen. We did it when I remember in 2017 in Florida, Florida, we brought in uh, uh, Donnie Sellers out of the bullpen for the first time of the season. He had never done it. You know, he had done it the year before and, you know, thank God we had done that. So we had a little bit of experience, but he hadn't really done it all season. And then, you know, it was, it was leverage. We brought him in, in, in that spot and he was able to be effective. So I think that they all have to be able to pitch. And in, in addition to being able to look different, in addition to being able to have different looks, they also, all of your pitchers should be able to be comfortable doing a lot of different things. And you're going to have your Friday guy, maybe that's just, that's your starter. He's going to start 15, 16 times. That's going to be it. But everybody else you know, you, they got to be able to do a lot of things. They have to be able to fill a lot of roles and they have to be able to be comfortable doing a lot of things because, you know, what happens when, you know, the conference starter is asked in pro ball, like we need to zoom you to the big leagues. Like we need to get you to the show. You know, you're our, your first round pick. We need to get you into the big league bullpen right now. We saw it happen last year at Tennessee. Yeah. You know, Garrett Crochet gets drafted. He's a starter and had been a starter for the previous two years. I pitched out of the bullpen his freshman year and he's in the big leagues, you know, three months later with the White Sox as a, a leverage bullpen piece and a, and a team making a playoff run. Like he had to be comfortable doing that. And he had to be able to do that. And you have to be able to fulfill a lot of different roles. Cause you just never know when that's going to happen. Well, especially in this day and age when the game has changed so much and we've found out so much more medically that uh, you know, how much, how exhausting it is and how damaging it is to pitch that, right. that we know so, we have so much more information and know that guys are going to have to be used different ways and difficult to do. Let, let me close on just one kind of wacky thing, maybe. Um, why is it guys can't be a high three-quarter guy and just say, okay, I'm going to add submarine to my repertoire? Why is that so hard to do? I think it's because it's something that, no, I mean, very rarely do you see people practice these things. And very rarely do you see people try to be in a natural environment and be able to throw, like, look at um, – Look at Russell Wilson play football. 
Like he throws from like seven different arm slots. Mm -hmm. Like look at all these guys. They throw from a bunch of different slots. Pat Mahomes is one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL, if not the best quarterback in the NFL. And one of the things that's really great about him is he's creative. And you don't see pitchers do that very often. You see them on the line, they're playing catch, they're coming set. And it's like, no, <laughs> you need to go like take ground balls at shortstop and try to like turn double plays and try to throw from different positions. Like we have our, you know, when we do PFP with our guys, we have them working on the in play at third base. Like they're making the play off balance, throwing to first. Yeah. Um, doing the same thing, throwing from the six hole at shortstop and making plays up the middle and taking ground balls at all over the field. Because if you can do, if you, if you can manipulate your slot, then there's no reason why you can't randomly drop down if you wanted to, because you should be athletic enough to do a bunch of different things, but you just watch all these guys. They're just, you go watch a, you know, a, a team play, you know, we watch us too. I mean, we have guys that are like this. We have guys that are certainly victim of this, but they play catch and every time they come set and then they throw the ball. And it's like, that's not how, that's not how the good Lord intended you to play catch. I promise you, he promised, he wanted you to move around like an athlete and throw the baseball and have some fun. And I think that like guys don't, guys are afraid to try stuff sometimes. And, you know, I think that empowering them to say, look, you know, you throw a lot, have them go, you know, take six ground balls at shortstop. They don't come set and throw the ball to first base and they're trying to get somebody out. They just get rid of it. And a lot of times you'll find a guy's natural slot that way. I mean, I know that's kind of like not, that's nothing revolutionary I'm saying. I mean, people have done that for years, Yeah. but if you watch guys do it, it's like, it's why it's so fun to have, you know, the, your best player coming in or one of your better players coming in be like the shortstop on the baseball team. And also is like the best pitcher. Because it's they've had to do a bunch of different things. They've had to throw from different slots. They've had to, you know, be be a good athlete. And you know, those guys end up being sometimes, most of the time, end up being really good pitchers at the next level. And you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm certainly not against like guys just pitching either. But I think that having some creativity with what you do is is really important. And that's that's one of the reasons why you don't all you don't see guys do that you don't see guys do stuff like that you see them like they're afraid that if they throw a ball from here or they throw a ball from here or something like their arms gonna explode or something and those that's just not that's just not gonna happen like, well gonna, we, we all know the pitchers are the best athletes on the field anyway i mean that's just, no, of course of course <laughs> just a given uh yeah i always used to take a day and, and make sure that one day in between starts i took i went over to first base and was the guy that they could throw to at first base. Just to number one, have some fun. Number two, loosen my body up, get things going, get the blood going, enjoy the game, but also making different kinds of throws, doing different yeah. things. Even when I was even when I was shagging behind the screen, taking throws from third base or shortstop, you know, trying to do different it's, things. It's really important. And I can't overemphasize this enough. Like when you're doing PFP with your guys, like make them go take ground balls all over the field. Yeah. Make them do all kinds of different things. Like, don't just put them on the mound and then roll a bunt to them and have them throw to first base at 70%. Because make them do all kinds of things. Make them, you know, turn, like I said, turn double plays, work on the in play, throw from the sit, make them do all kinds of stuff. Because that's going to make them a better, it'll make them a better fielder, which is ultimately what we would want them to be when they're on the mound. You know, having a like really structured, regimented PFP routine is, has some value, but it's way more valuable to put them in all kinds of crazy situations that force them to do things that they're not comfortable doing. That's when you find out, like you can find different things out about guys. You can find out who your better athletes are, who your better fielders are. You can force them to do things that are just wildly uncomfortable for them. Cause for most guys, like you said, leaving this traditional slot that they throw in is wildly uncomfortable yeah. for them. But if they have to make a do or die plate on the third base line and then NCAA regional to go to Omaha, they have to, they have to know that they can do that and they're not going to do that unless they practice at an incredibly high speed and you can't do that unless you get very, you get really variable with how you train PFP. Well, my last year and a half in the big leagues, I was every slot from here down to here with every pitch that you can imagine, you know, trying to find one that would get somebody out somewhere. Well, along. the most important thing you said was in the big leagues when you said that. <laughs> Matt, as always, great to talk to you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. Uh, we ran into you at the convention again last year and, uh, and spent some time with you and Marta and really appreciate that. Good luck to you and the Razorbacks in the upcoming year. You had four kids drafted in the 19 draft. 2020, we're just going to kind of throw that draft out as an aberration, and we'll see what happens this coming year. I know you'll be stocked, and uh, I know you guys will have a terrific season. 
Thanks and thank, best luck to you. Thank you, Larry, and thanks for having me on. Really appreciate it. Great, always great seeing you, and I can't wait till we can run into each other in person. Sounds like a deal.